Crusader Kings 3 has what feels like a limitless number of campaign starting locations across its vast map, covering both historical bookmarks of 1066 and 867. Following up on our last list of starting locations, I wanted to do another list of locations based off of a lot of feedback, recommendations, or at least parameters set out by you guys in the comments section. Today we're going to go through seven more starting locations that are, in my opinion, a lot more difficult than the ones we previously talked about. If you haven't seen that video, it's linked in the upper right corner, but everyone on this list, either in 867 or 1066, starts out as a count or a duke of a liege. This is a double-edged sword, as you get a certain level of protection from outside forces declaring wars against you, but you also will have to plot and scheme to get either your own independent um, faction or take over your liege's throne. I've ordered the list from easiest to hardest starting locations, and in continuing with keeping my information transparent, you'll see each member of this list in the table of contents in the description or the corresponding chapters in the timeline. And as always, if you decide to pick the game up after watching this, please feel free to use my link in the description. You'll simply receive a Steam key that you'll go ahead and place directly into Steam, but I also get a lovely commission. And as of the creation of this video, there's a 12% discount going on until October. October 1st. But let's get started on seven more campaign starts in Crusader Kings 3. Our first starting location is going to be huge if you're a fan of the show Vikings. You can play as the historical character behind Rollo. Um, obviously, I can't pronounce this name very well, but there it is right there. And you start as a liege to Bjorn Ironside. And the interesting thing about this starting location is, and the why I've marked it as the easiest of the lot, is that, yeah, you are a vassal of Bjorn, and you're also still a part of the grand sons of Ragnar Lothbrok's invasion of Northumbria. So you can go and take part in this uh, war, if you so wish. You can go try and carve out your portion of England and use the decisions. Let's go ahead and bring that up and restore Danelaw, if you so wish. Um, or... You can go ahead and try and do the historical thing that Rollo did. He went down over here to France, into Francia, and created Normandy, essentially, by, by uh, raiding into uh, the Kingdom of France. So you have a lot of really cool options at your disposal with Rollo. And like I said before, this character is not necessarily difficult, even by the standards of some of the things we've talked about before. You have a pretty much a choose your own adventure in this character. And I put him on this list because I'm a huge fan of the history of Normans and Normandy throughout the medieval era. So I think it's a really cool kind of historical start. And it's one that I think a lot of people can relate to or at least connect to uh, because maybe they've watched Vikings or so or so on and so forth. But it is a very fun one and you are relatively protected because people to the north of you, while they maybe not have the best opinion of you and they are a good chance for uh, expansion, you're pretty well protected by Bjorn Ironside and you yourself are are a pretty decent vassal within his kingdom, so you have a good amount of strength. But I think this is a pretty good one for an 867 starting location that is pretty easy and will get you slowly rolled into the game, um, especially because you have a nice, fun, big war to jump into as you see fit. Moving forward to 1066, but staying in Upland, we have Eric the Heathen. Now, this is going to be an interesting one because you start as the Norse faith, which is hostile to the Christian faith. And your liege, as you can see, or Catholic, sorry, is Catholic. So this makes for a very interesting situation. You do start as one of the stronger vassals to your liege as the king of Sweden, and it's going to create a little bit of tension for you, obviously, between your liege and that character. But also a lot of the surrounding characters you're going to be facing up against um, are either of Norse, which are some, most of these are uh, Catholic, but you do as you get further up, you get to see more Norse and then some uh, Finnish um, religions so you can push into them or you can try to take over Sweden as the king of Sweden. Eric the Heathen is not necessarily insanely difficult and I think he's number two on this list as far as uh, difficulty goes or I'm sorry number I guess you could say six on this list as far as difficulty goes because 
he is a little bit of a step up and i think that being as a being a hostile religion to your liege does kind of put you at a big disadvantage to get some things done so you can push eastwards into uh, finland and the such you've got the decisions that are very similar to what you had with rollo in restoring the dane law so you can go back here to recreating the dane law and getting the nickname the dane but um, with this kind of hindrance to religion, and I think this is a fan favorite. A lot of people have done Eric the Heathen. I think he's one that a lot of people have tried out and had a lot of fun with, uh, because you have so many expansion options, especially here over into Lithuania, into portions of Poland, um, Denmark. So the, the sky is really the limit on this one, and since you don't have a number of decisions that really guide this campaign, you can really go any which way you want here. You can create this grand, reformed Norse religion because you're feudal already, which is, is very nice. Uh, most of the Norse religions in 1066 are not feudal. They're still tribal, so you have to make that conversion to feudal. So this is nice that you can already start out as a feudal um, realm, and you can create whatever kind of uh, empire you want from this because you don't have to worry about converting to feudal and dealing with that whole situation. You still are an unreformed faith, so you can reform this faith, and that does create its own series of challenges and uh, fun little playthroughs that you can deal with. Uh, but the big thing here is that you do start with one of the holy sites, and you can see, though, that the majority of the holy sites are going to be pretty hard to get to unless you want to jump into outright war. So this one is a little bit of a step up in the difficulty range by comparison to Rollo, but I still think it has a lot of fun things going for it. Jumping further westward, our third one on this list is Duke Nuno of Portugal. Now, this one is a very interesting one because you do start as a pretty decently strong vassal under the King of Galicia. And you already know that this is a pretty tumultuous position right now, right? Um, if we take a look at everything, you've got the Kingdom of Leon, Galicia and Castile all vying for power of the three Spanish thrones trying to combine everything. Now, if we look at your decisions, you still have that objective as well, uniting the Spanish throne. But historically, this is the character that formed and created Portugal. So you have a really cool kind of victory condition here that plays in line with your character's history. And you already start off with a good portion of what you need. You just need to move further south to get Beja and Algarve to create Portugal. Now, the cool thing about doing this is you become the head of the Portuguese culture, um, I don't think I can actually, yeah, you can't actually bring it up because it's not been created yet, uh, which is going to grant you two random innovations fully discovered, and you'll be able to further the ones from there. You start out as a Galician. Um, in addition to that, it's going to convert all of your lands to Portuguese. So... If, as kind of a little tip, if you do decide to do this campaign, um, what you can do with it is you can kind of gather up more land than you need for just Portugal and then create Portugal and all those additional lands will become Portuguese as well. I think this is a very fun one because it is difficult. You are surrounded by hostile religions down here to the south of the Iberian Peninsula in Al-Andalus. And in addition, uh, you're dealing with three pretty powerful kings right now that all have a pretty set idea for what they want in their Spanish kingdoms. And after you create the kingdom of Portugal, you can create, you can unite the Spanish thrones if you want and put all everything into one crown, or you can do it in reverse, unite the Spanish thrones and then get the kingdom of Portugal to help you with the creation of the empire of Hispania. So I really like this campaign because it's different than the three kingdoms of Spain that we've talked about. In our last video, we talked about the Kingdom of Castile, but I think that the Duchy uh, in Duke Nuno is a lot more of a challenge because you are not this large, powerful king, and you have a lot of things you have to do to try and create the uh, Kingdom of Portugal. Number four on our list was actually recommended by one of our viewers, Mike Eller, and he was recommending both of the princes of the Tulanids. I decided to go with Alexandria as I feel it's a little bit more fun of a campaign, but let's take a look at this one as it's pretty interesting. So you have Alexandria and depending on what your 
stewardship roles at, because this will be different for every time you start your character, um, you are going to be over your holdings. Now, this isn't so huge at the start because you have a little bit of a grace period, but for every single holding you are above your amount of holdings, so in this case, five, you will receive a 10% per penalty of for both vassals, taxes, and I believe it's opinion is the other one. So right now we would receive a 50% penalty on all those things. So right when you start the game out, you have to start divvying out domains to other characters and courts to create vassals right out the gate. So if you don't have a very strong um, grasp of how vassals and courts work, this is actually going to be quite a challenging campaign for you. In addition to that, though, you have a lot of growth pushing to the west and to the south. The east is going to be a little bit of a challenge here with the Abbasids right on your doorstep. And you do have one of the uh, uh, Islamic holy sites to starting out right over here in uh, the Tulinid Empire. Now, one thing to also keep in mind here is that you are, of course, um, a vassal to your father and he's also your heir. So until you actually set yourself up with a strong marriage and get some good heirs going, he's going to, of course, be your heir. But you are also his heir. So you kind of have to spend a lot of time ensuring that you maintain supremacy above your brother and your brother doesn't try and knock you out through assassination or anything of the sort. So I think this is a very fun campaign if you're trying to get um, a campaign in North Africa that is a little bit different in 867. Also, you have a fun decision here to unite all of Africa, which is going to give you, if I press this button, quite a large amount of land to focus on. So I think this is a very fun and challenging campaign to get started with in the Egyptian area. All right, we're getting into the heavy hitters here. Comes from another one of our viewers, Strovariath, who also recommended Duke Nuno. But Marrakesh is a very interesting one. Um, Emir Yusuf has a, a very interesting start to start out with. Obviously, he is, again, a vassal of a liege um, in the Almoravid Grand Emirate. But he has a pressed claim to this. So right out the gate, this can be what you kind of focus on in doing, right? Is kind of creating the Grand Emirate for yourself in your own name and essentially usurping your liege. And I think that this is a very interesting starting location, right? You start off with a very strong army at 1100. I think your liege only has 1600 by comparison. Yeah, I think that actually includes your strength. Um, so you have a lot of troops that you really have at your disposal. And if I kind of switch this on over to kingdom titles, you can see that this will also give you a huge swath of land. Historically, this character is really awesome. Uh, Amir Yusuf is the one that, that defeated King Alfonso VI of Castile at the Battle of Zalaka. So in doing so, if you take a look at your decisions, you also have some really fun late or mid to late game um, options. You can, again, you can unite Africa if you so wish, like we talked about before, but you can also avenge the battles that were lost to Charlemagne after um, all of all Andalus was taken over. So you could go here, avenge the Battle of Tours, and you have to completely control Iberia, which is a, a hard nut to crack within itself, and then Southern Francia. So this makes for a really fun progression here. As you take over the... Um, Oops, let's go ahead and switch that all back to normal there. As you take over the Almoravid Emirate down here, you then can push up into the Iberian and then into Aquitaine to get a lot of land and recreate the proposed conquest that was initially um, set out by the Muslims that took over all of Iberia. I think that the Marrakesh starting location is really unique and I think it's kind of, it floats in under the radar because I think a lot of people would just think, simply think to go for the Almoravid Empire. But I think that historically, this makes for a really fun and rich campaign that you can really take advantage of in either solidifying all of Africa or pushing northward into Iberia and West Francia. Second hardest one is the Euclid dynasty here. Now, they start as a vassal of the Seljuk Turks, and they have a lot of crazy things going for them, right? He's 37, so he's got the chance to have a pretty solid wife option to make even more kids. He already has three, so you have uh, three potential heirs that you can take advantage of. But you do start at war with the Byzantine Empire for the invasion of Armenia. So this is going to be obviously a pretty stacked war. You've got 10k on 28k, and um, it's going to be a lot of fun to either contribute to this or not.
I'd say the ultimate goal, though, of this campaign is to create the Sultanate of Room. Now, this is a very interesting one, right? That this was, um, historically speaking, the Sultanate that was created to rule over Romans or Room. And you have the ability to do that in this campaign as a vassal of the Seljuk Turks. And in doing so, you become independent. You establish the independent Sultanate of Room. You become independent and you get, well, you guessed it, the kingdom of room so you'll see that it's not on the map right now you'll be creating it which is pretty awesome and in addition to that it's not the easiest thing to do when you look at this um list of requirements we're gonna actually cook on over to the duchy titles but go back to this list of requirements form the sultanate you have to take this duchy this duchy this one just kind of moving our way up and almost like a direct line over to here and to here. So creating a line from these locations is gonna be difficult in and of itself, but you have to try and get the connecting locations to make it all work for you, or else you'll have your Sultanate over here and your land over here, and you'll be independent and surrounded by necessarily, and not necessarily enemies, but you'll be surrounded by people that are not just your own land. So. I found this to be a really interesting one and a very fun one because you're creating kingdoms and you're you're trying to create something historically accurate, I guess you could say, in the Sultanate of Room. And it's really difficult because you have a huge Goliath to deal with in the Byzantine Empire, which at 1066 is still a force to be reckoned with. All right, number one on this list is Mazanderan, and I apologize if I mispronounced that. This location is particularly difficult. If we take a look at this, you are smack dab in the middle of a lot of Goliaths all around you to the east, to the west and the Abbasids, to the north. I mean, you have so many natural enemies. And on top of it, you're not really in a good position. Uh, you, your, your religion already is hostile as a Zoroastrian faith against this Muslim faith. Um, so your liege hates you. Um, you do have the, the advantage of having a, an heir already and you can marry into a potential alliance. But... This location, and you do start off as quite a strong vassal, so you do have some things going for you. But like I said, with this location, you have so many mammoth opponents to your east, west, and north that expanding out from here is going to be quite difficult. It's going to require a very high understanding of how to go to war, how to create those claims if need be, how to best use your holy wars if need be, and understanding how this religion actually works. Um, we do start off with one holy site here, which is nice, giving you bonuses to learning and popular opinion. And you get divine marriage, which increases the opinion from vassals of the same faith. If you marry a close family member of the first time, grants a large amount of piety as well. So you do have some things going for you. And the fact that it is also a theocratic race, or I'm sorry, a theocratic um, faith, does allow you to get some uh, temple holdings taxes. And you can replace this uh, member or the, uh, the head of your faith here by because uh, of your clerical appointment is temporal for life. So... You have benefits, but I think that the things that are stacked against you are so high and difficult that it makes this starting location particularly interesting, very difficult, and from a historical standpoint, this is the center, this is the hub of the Syrian version of the Hashashin. So this is historically a very cool location to start out in, and I feel like all these cards stacked against you make for a particularly exciting location to start out in, because you are a count, whereas most of, this, most of the things we've talked about, you're a duke, and everything else around you, if you take a look at religion, um, they're not the same religion as you, and they're hostile towards you, so you'll be dealing with a lot of holy wars or just wars against your land in general, and expanding out from that is gonna be quite difficult. And at that, it brings our list to a close. I know these are some pretty unique and different starting locations where you do focus on being a count or a duke of a liege. And I think that there are a lot of really fun starting locations on the map still to explore. So if you do have some other fun ones you want to talk about, please, by all means, leave a comment below. Let me know the year and what you feel that kind of difficulty of that campaign would be like, as well as explaining a little bit about the campaign. It helps give a frame of reference. There are so many other fun starting locations across the map. I'd love to do another video of this, maybe focusing on another set of parameters. So by all means, please leave a comment. Let me know some other fun ones that you're really enjoying in your playthrough of Crusader Kings 3. 
But as always, guys, thank you so much for watching here today. If you are struggling with the game, you can use the link to the uh, playlist of all the guides I've created for Crusader Kings 3 to help you out. But as always, make sure to like, subscribe, comment below, all that fun action. But have a good one and take care.